please welcome Terry Holtheimer to the podium. People hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Pleased to be here tonight. Um, I am going to speak uh, about what I was asked to speak about. Um, <laughs> sometimes you give somebody a mic, they'll talk about anything. But uh, Patrick asked me very specifically to talk about some elements about the Arlington economy and how we've fared over the last several years and then what may be ahead. And then I'm going to add some things about what our challenges in the future um, may be. Uh, I, I usually have a little um, comment on some of the transition slides here, and this is, of course, Will Rogers. Um, no fit being a humorist when they had the whole government working for you. And it certainly has seemed to be the case recently where um, the challenges all seem to be associated with a, a very, very difficult national economy and a, and a rather complex uh, political uh, uh, environment. So this is what happened in the U.S. Uh, over the last quite a number of years. This compares all the way back to World War II. And you can see that we have had some dips, those little uh, little lines that go well beyond the, the midpoint there, um, are where we've had uh, recessions, where we've had employment losses. And then there's been a several years over the, over the uh, last several decades where we've had losses in jobs uh, in the national economy. And right after World War II, uh, and then there was a, the, the stagflation of the Nixon years, the early Reagan years, when we had a had Reaganomics and a, an economy uh, that was weak. I remember the real estate bust of, uh, of 19, early 1990s, the dot com uh, bomb of the uh, 2000s. But the, the current situation, where we've had three years of really dismal economic performance, you can see is the worst since the, the Great Recession on a national basis. And, and it's by, by a long shot, not by just a little bit. So uh, what we're trying to work our way out of nationally is a very serious situation. Um, so you can, this is the last several years, and this is U.S. employment, where we, um, we started having some real challenges in, in um, 07 and 08 and 09 were very dismal economic performance. A little bit of a comeback in 2011, where we've actually had some job growth, uh, probably related to stimulus spending and construction jobs. Um, uh, but uh, as you'll see, it's, it's been a little bit of weak. Uh, the annual job change in the Washington metropolitan area uh, has been uh, a little bit stronger. The 92 period, when, when that was driven primarily by real estate, uh, were a period of job losses. And then we had 09, uh, which was a very poor year. But by and large, Washington has been blessed with an average of you know, 35,000 new jobs every year in a fairly consistent manner. And we went through a period, uh, both in the 90s, when we were up, to, up uh, well over 60,000 jobs a year. And then in uh, the early part of this decade, after 9-11, we were up, uh, up around 60,000 or so jobs a year, new jobs. So this, this regional economy has is used to job growth uh, of some, some pretty substantial amounts. Uh, but 2009 was a terrible year. If you look at, at um, kind of a change in all sectors, you can see monthly changes. 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, all positive. Uh, 2008 and 2009. Um, where we had job losses in most months, and then some recovery in this community in 2010, 2011, uh, which did not show up in the national economy. This was local. This was a regional effect, not a, not a national effect. And it looked like 2011 was starting to be a pretty good year. Uh, it was the first quarter of 2011. Uh, this region saw some pretty substantial uh, job growth. Uh, but the last three months have not been particularly strong. As a matter of fact, we've seen losses. If you look at, up at the different sectors, and I've disaggregated this by sectors at one point, but I want to look specifically at the change in federal jobs, because that tends to drive this economy more than any other one. And you can see all through 2009, when the regional economy was losing jobs, federal jobs were increasing. In 2010, federal jobs were increasing. The first part of 2011, federal jobs were increasing. And then the last three months, we've seen actual job losses in the 
federal thing, something that we had not seen uh, for a long, long time. So um, I think we're going to see challenges in the federal sector going forward for several years as well. Uh, and, and so what has always kind of driven us above the national economy and been a strength of ours, and especially in Arlington, is not there to kind of save us and bail us out at this point. Uh, this is Arlington. Arlington's pattern was a little different than the region and the national uh, economy. Uh, we went into the recession way earlier than anybody else. We had job losses in 2007. The regional economy was still growing in 2007. This may be a bit of a BRAC effect, but I don't really think so very much. Because we didn't see too many BRAC moves during that period. But 2008, 2009, 2010, Arlington actually saw monthly job increases. Um, and then our unemployment rate, of course, has, uh, has fluctuated. But Arlington performs better than anybody else. And if you look, the top line is the national economy up around 10%. Uh, um, uh, the state has done a little bit better, about 6 and a half, six, a little over 6% unemployment. In Arlington, now we're down below 4% unemployment. The Northern Virginia area generally performs better than the state. So this in Northern Virginia is below 5%. We went through much of the, the late 1990s and the mid part of the, of the 2000s uh, where our unemployment rate was down in the 1.5% to 2.5% range. That is a very tight labor market. Okay? And the only way uh, that we can increase jobs when you've got that kind of a tight labor market is to increase households. Okay? Because if you're not having new households, you're not getting people, you're not getting labor force to fill the jobs. And that's why some of these issues relative to uh, the share of regional growth that different communities are willing to accept uh, has become such an issue. We saw you know, some communities around the region starting to put limits and constraints on their housing supply. Our county put a limit on 1,000 new households a year as the limit on what they would accept in terms of regional growth. Montgomery County started having some moratoriums for various occasions on how much housing they were willing to accept. Well, when you have a very, very tight labor market and you have very high labor force participation rates, the only way you are able to provide labor for jobs, because you can't have a job without labor except an empty job, um, and so the household formation and the residential growth is very, very important to the economic growth of the, of the community. And, and so we are at a point now, uh, and I think we will be for a number of years, mm -hmm. where the labor market is relatively tight in this market. We can't say that nationally. There's many communities that wish they had a tight labor market. But we are now starting to be in the position of having uh, employers that would, would have, would hire people, would have jobs available, except they can't find the people that they need for the jobs. And the reason is they want extraordinary people. Okay? You cannot work for orbital sciences if you're not a rocket scientist. Right? You can't work for companies or the government agencies that need really, really highly educated people if we don't have highly educated people available to go to work. If they're already working, they'll jump jobs. But, you know, I mean, you only grow by having uh, people that are capable of filling the jobs. Arlington's very fortunate. We have about two-thirds of our adult population has a bachelor's degree, and we're, we're approaching now 30% of our adult population having an advanced degree. And as we've seen educational institutions expand here, uh, George Mason and especially uh, uh, George Washington University, it's just done a recent expansion, they are all doing continuing education. They are all working with people that already have master's degrees because in the engineering, engineering uh, uh, field, in the hard sciences field, whatever you learned in 1990 when you went to school is irrelevant today. Okay, things have changed so much. So this idea of constantly continuing your education is what we're into in this community. We happen to have the resources. We have the assets that allows that to happen. We have the labor force that attracts companies. So when I talk to a company about coming into Arlington, if we ask them, why are you here? Why do you want to come? What, what attracted you? It is partly the amenities and the environment that we've built. We have become a place people like to be. But they say it's because the people are here that we want to have. We want to hire. The corporate executive board came here, and their comment was, 
well, all of our people live there. Um, that's why we wanted to be there. And so, you know, uh, having uh, a population that is highly educated, highly skilled, and very invested in continuing education is particularly important. Having a marvelous school system is especially important. Even though they might not be, be laborers for companies currently, they clearly are the future labor force. And I see so many communities that aren't preparing their labor force, their school systems, are not turning out people that can work in those communities because they don't have the education levels to do that. Um, so there is this linkage that Arlington has with schools. It may be a stronger and better than almost any place else. That I, but I digress. Um, we're talking a little bit about development here um, and looking at kind of what's happening currently. Uh, we have about 11 acre projects under construction, about 1.3 million square feet of office space. That's, uh, you know, um, a little bit more than the long-term average for Arlington. We generally average about 900 square feet of office space being constructed a year. Long-term, 30 years, okay? This happens to represent 96% of all office construction in Northern Virginia is in Arlington. Uh, as we look at near-term starts, we've got another six projects um, that are uh, likely to start. Those are primarily residential projects uh, and retail projects. We've got um, another 18 in the pipeline that have been approved. We've got some that don't look like they're going to get started. They've uh, anytime soon. They've gone through um, the, the core market. The companies that uh, got the approvals and the entitlements for the project may have gone bankrupt. The projects may have sold. They're looking for financing, can't get it. So, you know, there's always a number of projects. There. But, you know, we've always got something waiting to start. Uh, and, and as the county approves additional projects, it just adds to the pipeline. Some start quickly, some don't. But, you know, long term, uh, we're, we're set up pretty well. We've got 10 projects in zoning review right now. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot going through the site plan process. Okay, that's kind of the numbers we had five years ago. Um, and then we've got 10 projects with a million point six square feet uh, in the conceptual stage, where they are either in a special planning study, they've announced to us that they are preparing plans to come in. Um, and so um, development is always an issue here. It's never a time when nothing is happening. If it's not under construction, it's going through entitlements. If it's not going through entitlements, it's still in the planning stage. Um, and so we have a very healthy real estate market on the commercial side and the residential side. In a way, we've got a really hot market here in Roslyn because we've got five projects that just started in the last year. Um, 18, 12 North Moore Street, uh, Central Places is kind of, hasn't actually pulled the pin to start the construction, but we're doing the elevators and we're doing the infrastructure necessary to allow the project. 1776 Wilson is under construction. Sonoma and Slate, which is an S. Uh, ADG project, two residential projects under construction, Gaslight Square out in Aptos project. He's actually building nearly million dollar condos in this market, and he started this year. Um, that's faith. Uh, and then Roslyn Plaza, uh, one of the projects that I think actually epitomizes the 1960 plan for Roslyn, because it, it is that kind of the buildings floating over a plaza that was the, the design and the, and the concept for Roslyn in 1960. They're coming in to redevelop the project, the entire project. So we have an office market. You can't read this, it's unfortunate. But um, when I compare how we are doing to everybody else, you know, it's, it's reasonably good. Our vacancy rates in the Roslyn, Boston border, and Crystal City, uh, Pentagon City are actually around 10%. 10% uh, is a little higher than we might like to, like to be. But I would say it's, it's kind of amazing from the standpoint that the vacancy rate city is lower than it is in the Roslyn Balls before. Okay, and this is during BRAC. Okay, so Crystal City has weathered this pretty well, largely because we were able to extend most of the government leases associated with BRAC. Okay, but Crystal City is not going to crash. It is not going to have a situation like we had during uh, the PTO um, uh, period when, when Lost three million square feet overnight, and uh, and it took a few years to refill that space. Crystal City, it's much more incremental, where where property owners are going to be uh, redeveloping or renovating uh, over a period of time. So we'll see the Crystal City plan that the board passed 
recently really starting to take shape. We've got a, a project that's come in for site plan. We've got two of them actually in for site plan and some others kind of ready to, ready to come in over the next year. We'll start to see a plan that we spent a lot of time working on starting to take place. But anybody who's looking for immediate results, uh, when I came to work uh, for the county 15 years ago, I took a company, it was a nonprofit, out to a site in, in uh, Clarendon, right across from the metro station. And the executive director of this nonprofit wanted to buy that property and build their headquarters on that property. And they brought their board out there. And I'm standing out in a, in a gravel lot with the board. Uh, and the board's comment was like, who is the idiot that suggested we come to this pit? Okay, and they actually fired the executive director for recommending the board buy that land and build that building. The building that was built on that site sold for the most money per square foot of any building in the history of Virginia last year. Okay, so, you know, things take time, and it's not always apparent uh, that, that things are going to be instantaneous. And, and the Crystal City plan is 35 buildings over 30 years. So if we do a building a year, we are doing what we had projected to do in Crystal City. Um, so, you know, we're, we're fairly, our market position is lower than the district in terms of prices and higher than Tyson's Corner at the moment. Um, this is BRAC, and BRAC, you know, the deadline for BRAC is tomorrow, okay? Everything is to be done by tomorrow, except that we have 3 million square feet still under lease that won't be um, let go until after 2015. Okay, so BRAC has, has had its effect where they just plain could not build the space that they needed to go into within the period of time that they were allowed to go. So at this point, all of the property owners have a strategy. They have a plan. They know when their leases are going to be up. They know what they're going to do with the property, and it's not all going to happen at once. So <coughs> we, we always describe BRAC uh, as serious but manageable, a phrase that we have now used for everything that comes along in life. Um, but, but we felt that we actually could manage our way through BRAC and, and have, have actually done that. Um, so our net office absorption, I always like this slide. Um, one of my staff members hates this slide, but, uh, but I, I compared, if you look in, the, in these columns over, over here, I have a pointer, but I've already got both hands full. Um, uh, this, this says how much of the action in Northern Virginia did Arlington capture? of the office space, the net leasing in the region, in Northern Virginia, how much of it happened in Arlington? Well, and, and every one of these is a major real estate firm that has a research group. And so they've said, well, you know, uh, Transwestern says 40%. Um, Cushman and Wakefield said we got 93% of the entire market. A couple of firms said we got about 30% of the market. Um, Grubb and Ellis said we got 92% of the market. Um, CoStar said we got 70% of the market. We're 10% of the office space. So we have captured somewhere between 30 and 70% of all of the net leasing in Northern Virginia last year. So we did really, really well. Okay, we, we basically beat the pants off of everybody. As a matter of fact, not only did we do well by ourselves, but we, we ate Fairfax County's lunch in the office market <laughs> during 2010. Okay, um, I love bashing Fairfax County if I get a chance. <laughs> um, and in 2011, though, look at this. In the first two quarters, we've got pretty substantial negative numbers from every single source. So that's showing there's some stress in the market. There's, you know, so we're not we're not doing poorly, okay, because we're doing pretty much as well as everybody else but we're not having the good year that we actually had last year. Now we've had some good news. We've had a couple of leases uh, that, that are pretty good. Accenture was announced last week. We've worked on that for a while. Um, uh, there's the Business Journal reported um, that CNA, uh, Center for Naval Analysis is going in, wants to go into the uh, project in, in Clarendon that's uh, in for site plan approval. And so we're seeing a situation where we may have some some leasing on some of the projects that are coming up. Um, and most of the projects that are under construction already have leases on them are pretty well, pretty well leased up. So Arlington's going to do fine, but the market is, is soft. It's a soft market right now. Uh, and it's going to be that way probably for a while. Major non-residential projects you could see 
750,000 square feet delivered in 2008, uh, 800,000 square feet in 2009, uh, kind of a weaker year in 2010, 400,000 square feet, um, and then uh, about uh, uh, 680,000 square feet so far this year. So we're going to have an average year. We'll be up close to 900 a million square feet to deliver this year. But some of these things were projects that would not have happened but for the county being involved in the project. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the George Mason uh, project. Uh, the county was a partner in a public-public pro uh, partnership in building the School of Public Policy. The, the county was a partner in the, uh, in the DARPA project that's under construction. Okay. We were partners in the hotel at Courthouse. We owned the land and did a partnership, uh, uh, a leasing deal uh, with uh, uh, Donahoe for a Marriott residence in. So those are projects that but for county action and county participation would not have happened. So those, those numbers are in here and that kept construction going during a pretty weak period of time. So we've got 800 North Glebe under construction. Uh, Founder Square, uh, the DARPA building is under construction, will deliver in December. Uh, 1776 Wilson Boulevard, that's a spec building by Skanska. That'll deliver probably later next year. And 1812 North Moore, a large project in, uh, in Roslyn. So we've got about a million three square feet under construction right now. The retail kind of comes with the residential and the office buildings. We don't build shopping centers, okay? But on the average, we deliver about 300,000 square feet of retail space a year, which is the equivalent to a community shopping center. It's urban retail. It's embedded in the ground floor of office buildings and residential buildings, okay? So in a way, it's kind of, you know, blends in to the environment. So it's not apparent that we're delivering a community shopping center every year, but we are in terms of the retail development that's happening. So non-residential projects um, approved. We've got about 2.7 million uh, in the pipeline that are likely to happen sometime soon. Um, we've, the housing market, I, I'll talk a little bit about the housing market because we have a somewhat different spin on the housing market than you typically would read in the paper. Uh, for instance, housing sales and prices, you can see the prices have, have been a little bit lower on the detached and, and attached in condos. You know, they, they, were, they were a little bit higher on the average sales um, per, uh, uh, in 2007 than they are now, but they're not down by very much. Now, when you look at average sales, at, what is in that pool of average sales per year is a different pool. Okay. The reason that the numbers were down a little bit in the last couple of years on the average price wasn't because the price of the units declined. It was because the more expensive units, the million dollar, the two million dollar houses were not in the pool. They were not on the market. Okay. So when you look at average prices, you can get a somewhat misleading view of what the housing market has actually done. The housing, this shows a great picture of the housing market. There are 50 metros or cities in the country that would love to have this picture of the housing market. This understates the strength of the housing market in Arlington. We had a fundamental change in, in, in market dynamics in this country uh, over the last several years of the, of the 2000s decade. For many, many years, we had a ratio or a, a relationship between median income and housing price. Okay, it, it's the whole idea that you pay for housing out of your current income. And as real income increases, then you're able to pay more for housing. But, you know, the real income and, and, and inflation and housing prices tended to have a stabilizing effect. And that ratio between income and housing price, actually we could take this back a couple of decades and it would be the same, rela same relationship. Well, what, all was, what happened? Well, what happened was that that re relationship between housing price and income got warped. It changed dramatically. In beginning around 2003, we, it, we went from, you know, this, this is generally around um, 2.2 to 2.5 times median income. It went up to five times median income. It more than doubled. Um, uh, in terms of the, the of of the kinds of the relationship between income and housing price, that's totally non-sustainable. It, it's insane because you can't have housing prices going up faster than real income. It just is not sustainable and makes no sense. 
And that's part of the reason we had a housing crisis and a housing bubble burst, because this is a national trend, not, not just a local trend. Okay. And, and anybody who looked at the chart would say, hey, this doesn't make any sense. This was horrible for Arlington, okay, because as we saw housing prices increase, more than incomes, more than, 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 than the, uh, uh, the real income of the households, uh, we started to have a situation uh, that really damaged affordable housing affordability in the community. Okay? So this was not healthy. This was horribly unhealthy. And it broke this long-term relationship and really caused an enormous stress on affordable housing in this community. It did in other places too. But in Arlington, prices don't go down. In other places, prices go down to accommodate those kinds of, of you know, national and, and short-term cycles. In Arlington, they never went down. So this relationship now puts us among markets that no longer have that relationship of about 2.5 to 2.7 times median income in terms of their housing values, as most markets around the country do. We're up there with with New York, San Francisco, and LA, where our relationship between housing prices and income is no longer what it was. It's, you call it a new normal, you call it whatever, whatever you want, but we have become relatively less affordable over time because of this, and we're probably stuck here, and it's unlikely to, to come down to the national norm or national levels. However, there's some good things about the housing market as well. For instance, if you kind of look at what the trends are in housing sales, you kind of feel, well, gee, our sales are down. They're not as, as, as high as they were. There's not as many sales in the market as there were. However, and they're not. It's down about 10%. The number of homes sold per year for the last three years has been about 10% lower than the, than the average over the prior decade. But our share of the Northern Virginia market went up. Okay, We used to have somewhere around 11% of all homes sold in Northern Virginia were in Arlington. Okay, and it, that was kind of a long-term trend. It was relatively stable over time. And then it went up to 13%, and then 16%, and now it's somewhere around 13, 14%. So our share of the regional market is greater than it used to be, which means that we are having more sales in Arlington and l fewer sales in places like Prince William County and Loudoun County. Okay, so they are way, way, way below normal, and we are way, way above normal, just in terms of the volume, even though the volume is lower than it was several years ago. Okay. And then sales price, the same thing. Um, we had uh, prices going up. Uh, we, we now have had uh, prices that are about 15% higher than Northern Virginia uh, has had price increases over the last several years. So I'm going to running out of time, so I'm sp skipping some of the of the numbers. I like numbers. I'll talk about them all night long. So fiscal <laughs> position. This is this is how we we collect our money. This is where our money comes from. All these sources of local taxes, and this is how we spend our money. This is not a normal pattern. Okay, we spend 38 percent of our money on schools. The suburb suburbs, Loudon, Fairfax, those those areas spend 66 percent of their money on schools. And yet our per capita expenditure on schools is, great, is higher than any of them by, by a long shot. And why? Well, it's taxes from business. We have uh, about $370, $380 million in this year's budget comes from business taxes. And that's about 46% of all, all own source um, uh, taxes. Okay, that's about double what everybody else has. Okay, so my, my point as economic development director is, is I, I feel that, that I am a proponent of the business part of the economy because it does represent such an enormous part of, of the local tax base. And I do want to cover these points, and I'll cover them quickly. Um, but we have challenges. Uh, you know, the picture is pretty good. We've outperformed everybody in the region, probably outperformed everybody in the country. Uh, but what are our challenges ahead? Because you wanted to talk about the future. Security is, a, is an issue. Security is an issue from... Uh, the fact that, that Arlington remains a target, that we have highly secure, highly sensitive types of businesses and agencies here. Uh, the entire uh, federal security standards issues have changed. Okay, We need to do hardened buildings. We only had to do the DARPA building because the federal standards 
for a secure building were so high that we created actually the only urban secure building in the United States. Okay, it happens to be worth it. It's an agency that, that probably produces more per square foot benefit than any other federal agency out there. Uh, so selectively it was a, a, it was a good move. But security will always be with us as an issue. Um, Metro Tysons, okay. Um, we are now going to have four new metro stations in Tysons and several on, on the Silver Line that directly compete with us. We never had to compete with Tysons as a metro location. If you wanted metro, you had to be in Arlington. Well, now we're going to have heavy, heavy competition from Tysons on the west that we've not had before. Then you look at emerging office markets with South, Ca South Capital and Noma. That is going to be heavy competition as well. The price competition in D.C., D.C. has always been higher than us, you know, 10 to 15 percent higher than, than the county. Um, but now we have price competition, comparably priced office space in huge amounts that are directly co uh, competitive with us. So we got competition on the east, competition on the west that we've never had before. Um, local regulations. We are a highly regulated environment. Now most urban districts are, um, but we're, we're not getting less regulated. Uh, generally, and it's very hard to get development entitlements and to go through the process of being able to develop in, in Arlington, um, and, and that is a bit of a, a competitive issue. Wor uh, workforce, um, you know, we have a great advantage in workforce, but we have to keep it, okay? We have to continue to educate people. We have to continue to make sure that, that our workforce is, is ready. Aging commercial building stock, we've got a, you know, the whole Crystal City plan was predicated on 30 buildings that are 30 years old or over uh, that no longer were uh, uh, attractive uh, office stock. Okay, we had a similar problem with our hotel stock a number of years ago until we built seven hotels in the last five years. Um, and so maintaining a competitive physical environment is important. Uh, we have an enormous dependent on dependency on the feds, about a third of our our office base is based on, on federal uh, occupancy. Well, what if that goes away? I mean, the rules that we're seeing right now would basically uh, uh, prohibit almost uh, the federal government from leasing office space in, in Arlington based on many of the, uh, based primarily on price, but other kinds of factors, security and other factors as well. So, you know, we're looking at what if we lose the federal base or we lose a substantial part. We've already left, the, lost the Department of Defense was, which was 20% of our federal base. Now we, we're, you know, looking at, at that. And what's going to fill it? What are, how are we going to fill that space? Um, maintaining successful retail. We've been very successful on the retail. Okay, but now we're going to have the largest shopping center on the East Coast on the metro. Okay, what's that going to do to Boston Common? What's that going to do to Pentagon Fashion Center? How will we rem remain competitive on, the, on those kinds of retail goods and services? We have a very mobile population. That means that people move here and our workforce moves here and they're great people and, and all that, um, but they can move away tomorrow. And you can see many communities that have seen major portions of their population move literally overnight to more attractive places or other kinds of places or where jobs move, people move. I don't think we're gonna have a difficult situation, but, I, but when you've got a situation where half of your population changes every five years, that's a high level of mobility, one of the highest levels of mobility that you can find, okay, almost anywhere. And then you've got the congestion problem. So these are all challenges. And I'll, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip my prognostications, but, I'll, but in the interest of saying, of kind of addressing your issue of the future, you know, Economic Development and the Economic Development Commission has been working on a project called Economic Sustainability. What do we need to do long term to make sure that our economy is, is sustainable? What are the right things to do now that pay off 20 years, 30 years from now? Okay, it's not an immediate payoff. It's what's the right thing to do long term? And, and Melissa Bondi from the Economic Development Commission is working on it. Cindy Richmond from my staff is working on it. And I would suggest that might be a wonderful conversation for a future meeting of the Committee of 100 in terms of what does the community, not just the county, um, need to do to ensure our long term economic sustainability. So I'm going to stop here five minutes after I got the stop sign um, <laughs> and turn it over to Lincoln. I'll be glad to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Terry. Wow, that, that is spectacular. 
Now, I know all of you will have questions. The, the drill is, put your hand up. We, we have uh, two people handling the microphones, and they'll go around, and, and uh, I will up, uh, identify which person is to speak. And, and please, just a quick question. If you're going to make a statement, be prepared to have me in interrupt you, because we want to hear more from Terry. First hand I see here, Gail, would you state your name and a quick question? Hi, I'm Gail Dennis. I live in North Arlington in a section called Maywood, which has many re construction restrictions on it. Um, it seems to me that when I moved to Arlington in 1978 into South Arlington from D.C., I moved here because the taxes were lower, there was no parking fee, there was open ground, and you could go to Parkington and park for free and do all your shopping. Um, I'm saying you work very hard. I'm, I'm sure you're very sincere. But I'm, I'm wondering, we're gradually covering every single inch of ground with a, with a concrete building of some type or another. And I wonder if maybe it's time to review, if maybe it's time to review that policy and see if to indeed we really need all these buildings. It only took 25 years to put a fire station on Lee Highway. Maybe we could take some of the money that, that was not used for that fire station for 25 years and use it for some other purpose that would be economically useful, like putting in bigger sewers for the new buildings. Thank you. I'll answer the part of that where I think it's a question I want to answer, um, <laughs> which, which has to do with the idea of, uh, of the new building and the new construction. And al although my department is heavily involved in the planning process, um, what our primary function is, is seeing to the implementation of the comprehensive plan. Okay? We, we don't uh, try to suggest that building goes where it's not appropriate. We try to make sure that construction and development happens where the Planning Commission and the Board suggest that development should happen. And so to the extent that we have had a plan and that the plan has taken a long, long time, 30-some years from the, the Orange Line plan to, to get to maybe 70% of it being implemented, uh, change seems to happen quickly, but it actually happens a bit more slowly. And planning, I say, really is influential in the community because the, the plan for the Roslyn Boston quarter was largely predicated on, on, on the metro and getting value out of the land around the metro and building urban villages that function as interesting kinds of places. And most of us are pretty much bought into that, that idea. But when you consider that a really substantial portion of the tax base, somewhere nearly 80% of all tax dollars come out of 11% of our land, that's really high yield property and development. And, and so for Arlington to not have it, and certainly to try to preserve a 1950s vintage kind of, of environment, wouldn't have been successful anyhow. So if you're going to develop, why not develop in a way that, that not only creates great communities, but also provides a huge economic benefit for you. And I'm seeing on your chart that's on the screen right now that you don't have a bullet about uh, environmental issues, green buildings, lead lead certified buildings and so forth. Could you speak to that? I, I think that, that kind of uh, is what I was alluding a little bit to on the sustainability issue. And too much of, of sustainability uh, has, has kind of focused on environment, but that's really important because if we're doing the right things as we develop, we are constantly improving our environmental position within the region. I wrote a paper a few months ago about that kind of benchmarking uh, Arlington against all the other communities in the Washington area called How Green Are We? And I use really specific performance data relative to development to demonstrate that we, in fact, are much more greener in terms of, of, uh, of hydrocarbon emissions and green buildings. We have double the percentage of green buildings of any other community in the region. And so looking at, at data, uh, we actually have, have been able to demonstrate that we are doing all of those things better, but we're just barely starting to scratch the surface on what long-term environmental sustainability needs to be with the energy policy and some other kinds of things. And, and, and I 
in our office we talk about not not being guilty of greenwashing, calling things green that aren't really related to long-term sustainability. Okay, but I think the county's doing a lot of those kinds of things, and our department is involved in virtually all of them. Yeah, I'm Charlie Clark. Uh, I was just wondering whether your counterparts in Fairfax and Falls Church and elsewhere would agree with some of these statements about Arlington outperforming everybody. I showed you the data. Um, they, they can call all of the research firms liars if they want to, but I got, I've got the data. Um, can you speak to the uh, generational differences? I know that uh, in Clarendon and so on that, you know, a lot of young people, is that, does that play into your uh, challenges on sustainability? Uh, yeah, very much so, um, in, in a variety of ways, both positive and negative. Um, you know, it is, it is a, uh, as the father of a uh, Gen Xer, um, you know, instant is not quick enough. Um, and, and, you know, so the idea of, of it kind of expecting things to change. As the baby boomer generation, we expected the world to coddle to us and to reflect our values. And now the next generation clearly thinks the mantle has been passed. And so there's challenges to employees in terms of what employee expectations are when you go to work with a firm, how long are you going to stay there, uh, what, what kinds of, uh, of benefits and things do you expect, okay, defined benefits plans out, uh, you know, other kinds of retirement uh, and, and incentives are in. So, you know, it's a constantly changing world. So that does play into things. But what I, I, I don't know that when we did the plans for the Roslyn Boston quarter, we asked sufficiently who was going to live there. In the 70s, did we really understand who was going to live there? And, and what we have is over 90% of the population of the Roslyn Boston Quarter are in one very tiny psychodemographic group. Okay, so if you, if you follow the psychodemographics, what characteristics uh, uh, are, are uh, accrued to various kinds of people who are similar? Okay, in age, in education, in income, in occupation. And there is a group that represents 1.65% of the U.S. population called Metro Renters, but they represent over 90% of the Roslyn Boston Corridor population. So their preferences and their buying patterns and what they want to see is very different than, than much of the rest of Arlington. And so as we start getting to issues like civic engagement, you know, we, we, had, a, we had a meeting last night on the sign ordinance and I didn't see a whole lot of Metro renters showing up except a couple of staff people. And so how do we engage people that don't, don't engage with us in the most typical, traditional kind of way? And so we're trying to use some technology. We've got a partnership with Virginia Tech and IBM at looking at new ways of civic engagement using technology, using social media, using other devices. So I think it's up to us to, to constantly try to make sure that we are speaking to our population and to the people who live and work here. Hi, I'm Mary Van Dyke, and I'd like to ask you if you could just talk around the issue between economic development and schools, um, given the population growth in this area, and you know the schools are using a lot of relocatables right now, but if they need to build a new building, how does that decision go through the county? I'll tell you, that's way above my job level. Um, <laughs> ask Ms. Hines or Ms. Garvey here. Um, you know, it's a challenge everywhere to have really, really quality schools. I think Arlington's done a, a really marvelous job to have, have three schools in the top 100 high schools in the country. is, is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement. Um, but no matter how healthy your economy is, uh, how well you're doing in terms of having a diverse uh, and relatively rich tax base. I mean, our, our tax base, our tax rates are lower than anybody else's, and yet our, um, the, the money that we have to spend on services, our service levels tend to be higher than, than any of the surrounding communities. But there's never enough money to, to do all the things we would like to do. Um, I think that the capital improvements plan is a challenge every year, and schools uh, are, are part of that. But, you know, not investing in education is, is horrible. I, one of my classes did a... Uh, an analysis, a studio down in King George County, uh, which is uh, south in, near Fredericksburg. And 80% and of their jobs come from the Dahlgren Naval Surface Weapons Center, a naval uh, base in Dahlgren. They're all high paying civil engineering jobs, okay? And yet the percentage of their students going to college is below 50%. 
the percentage that are AP are like 10%, and so they're not preparing a population to work where all of the job growth is in their community. We are. We are creating the kind of education system and turning out the, the students that can come back to work. And um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Scott Pedowitz, and I think that Metro Ventures description probably uh, pretty much describes me to a T. Um, you mentioned the challenge of having a transient population and losing a lot of the turnover, and I think sort of the demographic like mine makes up a lot of that. Thinking about sort of the needs as we sort of make our way through life and wanting to stay in Arlington, has there been any thought to what it takes to grab those young people who come in here so that they see an upward trajectory for them inside the county, and if so, what the county might be doing to help those life transitions as we make our way through adulthood? I mean, that's one of our biggest challenges, I think, is, is you know, uh, the, the typical um, three-bedroom unit in Boston, in one of the new high-rises, is like what my daughter's unit looked like a few years ago. Uh, three young ladies, 25 years old, one's an economist, one's a civil engineer, one's a school teacher. They've got a, a household income of $160,000. Pretty good for 25-year-olds, right? It's double the national average in terms of household income. But can they buy housing? Well, they can't buy housing, okay, because it's, it's almost impossible. My daughter was waiting several years for condo prices to crash as the, as the real estate uh, market crumbled across the country, and condo prices in Arlington did not decline at all. Um, she eventually ended up buying a, a condo in uh, Fairlington Village, uh, but it was a mighty uh, difficult prop proposition for her to be able to afford that. So I think that's a challenge for us. We can't really control um, housing prices, and we lost the relationship that was a rational relationship with housing prices. And so, you know, it is going to be difficult, but yet I know the cohorts of, of people that she went to high school with and people she went to college with, they are finding ways to get into the Arlington housing market. Virtually all of them work or now live in Arlington, and they're all still under 30 years old, and they've all bought housing. So, you know, not sure how they do it. Maybe it's magic, but people want to live here enough to find a way to afford to do it. And then, of course, you know, when you get married and you've got double incomes, you can start to grab the bottom bottom of the housing one. Hi, I'm Joan McDermott. Uh, I wonder what your office does to market Arlington to businesses and especially what you've done to uh, try to fill the vacancies that BRAC caused. The, the BRAC caused? Um, oh. But in general, too, how do you market Arlington? We, we, I, I won't say we spend a lot of money marketing Arlington. We do spend some of our economic development marketing and on advertising and promotion. And, and that's important. And I, I, I think it's how we have tried to reflect what Arlington is uh, from an economic development standpoint in the marketing message that we purvey. We have to be credible and we have to be realistic about what we say about the community. Okay? And I, I really hate the dog by the lake videos that every economic development agency has. If you ask, if you ask to see the video, somebody's walking a dog by a lake or a river or a pond or something like that, and everybody says, we are the best place in America to live, work, and play, okay, and visit if they want to go all four. Um, and we don't say that, okay. What we say is that we are important for our brain power, that the people here make real productive contributions to the community. And, and so all of our advertising and all of our marketing features individuals, people who work in the community. We have Christina Murata, who is a PhD uh, uh, chemical engineer who works for the Pentagon Force Protection Agency. Okay, she's a smart person who works here in this community. We've got Allison Frendak, who, who went to school with me. She's a PhD. She does peace operations at George Mason University. And yet we've got Eric Schaefer from Signature Theater, okay, who is a, a, a highly productive member of the community, very, very smart. Uh, we've got Tracy O'Grady, who opened Willow and runs Willow Restaurant in the advertising campaign. So we're saying something that's, that we believe is credible, that we not only have this marvelous um, environment and set of amenities and communities, because we have a, an Eric Schaefer and a Tracy O'Grady and, and, uh, and a Christina and, and an Allison and all these other people, um, but that we actually have people 
uh, that are innovative and creative and productive and creating the modern economy that we can perpetuate. So, and we've got research that shows the brain power. And as we market as a science center, we can show that we are, in fact, a science center, the third largest science center in the United States. So it starts with research, research, it starts with credibility, but the message has to be something that rings true to the companies. And, it, and they want to be here. They want to be here where people are productive. They want to be here where exciting things are happening. I love the comment that um, uh, Dr. Regina Dugan made at one of the luncheons we had, who she is the head of DARPA, and she says that, um, that DARPA's mission is to take the impossible, convert it to the improbable, and make it inevitable. Okay, DARPA only wants to work on projects with no visible solution, no apparent solution. Well, you take DARPA and you take Virginia Tech and you take the Office of Naval Research and you take a couple of these other groups. We have about 8,000 people who come to work every day in this community to work on a problem that's impossible with no apparent solution. Okay, that is the new economy and that's what's going to drive us. And that's a powerful message to people who want to be part of it. Good evening. My name is Scott Brandon. I have a question um, about Arlington's commitment to small business slash nonprofits. I had heard something about Biz Launch or so. Could you expound on that? Uh, Biz Launch is a program that we run. It's a center for um, for entrepreneurship. We work with the uh, uh, real small businesses who want to grow, but mostly with companies who want to or people, individuals, entrepreneurs who want to start a business. So we do about 40 um, workshops a year on different aspects of small business, how to start a business. We'll do something on, on how to sell to the federal government. We've done programs on, on food carts, how to start a food cart. Um, we've done on intellectual property. We've done on how to export. So we, we, get, we put a, over 3,000 people a year attend our workshops, and they're all free. And then we have a partnership with uh, SCORE uh, and the SBA, and they provide really, really excellent counselors who come in and will help you develop a business plan, help you learn what you need to know to be successful to get a business started. Um, but I think we've taken it well beyond where anybody else has. We, we actually started a partnership with the United Nations last month. Uh, in the U.S., we deal, we, our, our approach to small business is to teach people business skills. Okay, how, how are you going to what do you learn about business plan? What do you learn about financing? What do you know about marketing? How do you deal with, with things that are business skill related, learnable kinds of skills? And the UN's approach is behaviors. Do you have the proper propensity to behave in an effective way to be an entrepreneur? What, how do you feel about risk? Okay, are you so risk averse that you might not actually make a very good entrepreneur? How do you deal with, with other kinds of behavioral aspects of what makes a successful entrepreneur. And, and so they don't actually offer that in the US, but one of my staff has kind of forced us into an international partnership that, uh, that has allowed us to have a partnership with the UN that actually allows us to piggyback on some of the most progressive and innovative ways of helping small businesses grow uh, that's happening anywhere in the world. And it's very, very exciting to be able to do that. But, um, you know, I, I, we are committed to formation of small businesses. And, you know, over 70% of our businesses are Arlen the retailers and service businesses that you think of this kind of first floor people. They're all Arlington only businesses. They're not chains, they're not franchises, they're not, you know, uh, uh, something you're going to find in other cities. They're people and businesses that, that, that are here that are unique to us. And that's what we're trying to grow. We're trying to grow businesses that can be. Uh, interesting to have here. George Towner, uh, not everybody in Arlington uh, has a household that makes $160,000. We have significant uh, ethnic diversity and significant income diversity. How is the, your department uh, dealing with that set of facts? I think there's no secret that Arlington Board has one of the strongest commitments to affordable housing of any local government anywhere. Uh, and it's really important. And it's, as, as I showed, it's become more important over the last several years. But we have, you know, a couple of you introduced yourselves to me as being uh, related to some of the housing nonprofits and all. You know, the commercial sector plays heavily into that. There are affordable housing um, uh, linkages with every commercial building that is built. 
uh, money that goes into a pool to build affordable housing. There's affordable housing uh, commitments on every uh, residential building that is built. Uh, as we have looked at doing some things in the, in the, in the quarter, for instance, um, I, I think one of the things we were instrumental in doing was looking at the ability to kind of do a land swap on the old Peck property that basically brought the Jordan Manor property into a project that it was not into formally, formerly, and that was a key to being able to get that project through a process. We did a lot of economic studies to make sure that this whole project would work and function and basically convinced JBG and others that, that this project that had a large affordable housing uh, uh, component to it, had a university component and had a large office component, made sense economically to do and made sense according to the plan and the policies of the board to do. And I think we got 90 units of affordable housing in the metro corridor that would not have happened otherwise. So we're always cognizant of trying to bring affordable housing into the metro corridor as much as we possibly can. We're working on the Columbia Pike uh, project as well. Um, so it's actually my department ran the affordable housing programs for a number of years, but we haven't since I have been director. It's, it's somewhere else. But we have the same commitment to affordable housing that the board has in any way that we can, we can aid that effort, we will. In the beginning, you spoke of the need for and uh, the importance of residential development. But your slides overwhelmingly emphasized office development. Is, has there been a change in policy, or are we still trying to balance the two? I, I, didn't, I, I didn't show many of the residential slides because I kind of slipped through them. We actually have probably about three, three times as many residential projects as commercial projects under construction in Arlington at any one time. Partly because the commercial ones are the residential ones are, are a little bit smaller, but we have, you know, generally two to three times more residential high-rise construction under construction at any one time than we do corporate. The idea in the plan was generally to have about an even split in the Roslyn-Boston corridor between residential and commercial, and so we have developed about a little over 20 million square feet of, uh, of uh, office space and about 22,000 housing units in the Roslyn-Boston quarter. And if you look at a average housing unit being about 900 square feet, we have almost exactly identical amounts of physical development of office and residential in the Roslyn-Boston quarter in terms of the size of the density square footage of the buildings. What that gets you though is there are about four employees per thousand square feet, so four people working in a building per thousand square feet, compared to about two persons per unit living in the buildings. So you still don't exactly, you balance residential and commercial on the physical space, you st haven't balanced it on the people in the space. Okay, we still, we, we could have balanced it differently, but the plan balanced it that way. When we did Crystal City, the board asked us to do more residential space than commercial space, and, and we did to, them, to the extent that it was practical to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you very much.